I can start. Yes, please. Okay, I'm trying to get a. Hi, everyone. It's Joseph Trevisani from uh, Worldwide Market. Sorry about our delay this morning. Sometimes feel that Microsoft has a persecution complex. Anyway, good morning and good afternoon, good evening. Our topic today is an odd one. Uh, I've titled the webinar The Quantum World of Zero Rates. I suppose that requires an explanation more than usual. These are not terms one doesn't usually equate quantum physics, of which I am only passingly familiar, but its peculiarities are very interesting. Um, let's just put up a Fed funds rate here, give you an idea of what we're really talking about here. Come on, machine. Okay, there we go. Um, this is a chart. This is not going to be a heavy chart session today because most of this is conceptual. But at any rate, let's take a look at this. This is a chart. Oh, that's, of course, the wrong chart. Hang on. Here we go. Let's do this one. Okay. This is chained uh, US GDP with the Fed funds rate. And where does that get us? Well, the world of GDP, of economic analysis in general, tends to be a world of linear relationships. If you raise interest rates, you tamp down the economy. If you lower rates, you give the economy more room to breathe, you spur growth, you may spur inflation, things like that. This is the standard economic analysis been running around for since Keynes and long before that. Although the interest, the emphasis on interest rates has been the past two generations, I would say. Interest rates are, of course, the Fed's main tool, but in fact, they're the Fed's only tool. When Ms. Ms. Yellen talks about macroprudential regulation, if ever, you've heard a series of words, which means I'll say, what she simply means is regulation. What she's trying to say or imply with macro prudential regulation is that with the proper amount of regulatory intelligence, nothing said, you can affect the micro world, the macro world of economics with what you do. And of course that's true in the theoretical sense. In other words, if the Fed came out tomorrow or the banking regulators came out tomorrow and, and they raised the capital rates across the board necessary, the capital ratios necessary for, for banks to maintain themselves in business, um, if they doubled them overnight for whatever reason, maybe, I don't know, their pet told them to do so, um, then you would have a severe effect on the economy. That's certainly true. But in general, and in actuality, the idea of macro potential regulation, promoting growth is nonsense, or preventing things from happening. The Fed and regulators only get a hold of crises after they've happened. And then they go, that's what Dodd-Frank is all about. But there was an SNL crisis before that. There's always something that seems to happen in the economy. This is the nature of the system um, that the Fed then goes out and tries to fix, of course, after the fact. Generals fighting the last war and farmers closing the barn door after the horse has already flown. That's the essence, it seems, of uh, macroprudential regulation. 
So the linear relationship between interest rates and both inflation and economic growth is at the heart of central bank rate policy. It is the beating heart of central bank rate policy. Central bank policy aims to be counter cyclical, to even out the business cycle peaks and troughs, and to produce, if not utopia, at least an easier world to get along in. The biggest problem with this is the very short history of this attempt. If you look at the chart in front of us, we have the Fed funds rate going back as far as I could get a chart out of Bloomberg for it, these charts are all Bloomberg. And uh, the US chained GDP annualized by quarter of the same period. And is there any particular correlation we have here? Um, there's the strongest one is right here, back in the early 80s when Paul Volcker, first appointed by Jimmy Carter, um, and then confirmed again by Ronald Reagan, reappointed by Ronald Reagan. Seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Um, raise interest rates to squeeze out uh, Lyndon Johnson's basic inflation, and it is Lyndon Johnson's inflation. He preferred to run the Great Society and the Vietnam War without raising taxes. And guess what happened? Yeah, uh, inflation. Deeply embedded into the system. Raising interest rates squelched economic growth. Exactly what you would expect. Businesses need credit. People need credit to spend. Credit is too expensive economic activity slows. That's the linear relationship that central bankers have been utilizing, let's say for the past, let's just say the past generation. 80 is 30, that's 46 years, it's almost two generations in fact. Um, nonetheless, let's just go with it. And central banks have used their ability to manipulate rates after targeting inflation as the great culprit. Now, the great culprit, the great danger to developed economies was seen as inflation because inflation was very damaging and very damaging politically in the 70s and the early 80s. 12% inflation here in the United States is not a sign of anyone's achievements in central bank rate policy. So central banks around the world at the Fed's sort of leadership, at least leadership in the sense that they did it first, targeted inflation, successfully targeted inflation. Look at the, I have a, a, a chart here of one I had up earlier. Uh, wrong one. Hang on. Couldn't understand how Google could change week to week, but here it is. Fed funds and CPI. Okay. Let's see if everyone is seeing this one. Okay, this is Fed funds and CPI. Oh, we had this one up already. There we go. Um, this is Fed funds and CPI. It's not GDP. This is Fed funds and CPI. And after that initial squelch back in the early 80s, you can see that both rates, the Fed funds target rate, the upper bound, and uh, CPI, have been on a long, slow decline. The Fed and other central banks around the world have been successful in eliminating or greatly diminishing inflation in an economy. One would say this is an achievement, perhaps. The linear relationship that is evidenced in this chart
is assumed and has been assumed to carry beneath the zero bound to the area where the Fed finds itself now. One of the problems, one of the many problems with this is that it's my contention and it's why I'm using the quantum physics analogy that as you approach the zero range or below in interest rates, that linear relationship disappears. In fact, you often get opposite effects. Take a step back. What is quantum physics? There are two, two, two types of physics in the world. Well, probably more, but not being a physicist or a mathematician, I'll do my best with it. There's what was called Newtonian physics, the physics of Isaac Newton. That observes cause and effect relationships. It's the, it's the physics of our everyday world. If I push on a plate, it skitters across the table until it falls off. It continues falling under the effect of gravity until it hits the floor and then breaks. That's Newtonian physics. The same rules that, the same laws that govern the behavior, the mechanics of that plate on my table also govern the mechanics of the solar system. There's cause and effect, and it is readily appreciable although we can't explain the origin of gravity, it is readyable, readily appreciable by our senses. It is the world of our senses, is the world of Newtonian physics. However, quantum physics works in a very different fashion. When you get to the very, very small dimensions, atomic dimensions, the rules are very different. The act of observing changes the observation. Items, as we would call them, can be in more than one place at one time. The rules that govern our world do not operate as you get to very small dimensions. The laws of atomic forces are not the laws of Newtonian physics. And this, I think, since this is the first time, although it's not really true, but this appears to be the first time that central bankers have attempted to enter into this world. Now, that, of course, is not true. Japan has been operating in this world since the, late, since the early 90s. The example, and I've said this many, many times in all of my webinars, the example of Japan as an example of what to expect in an economy only manipulated by interest rates, or almost effectively interest rate where none of the other financial, cultural, or economic factors are changed proves the, fut the utter futility of attempting to run a modern, industrial, advanced, complicated economy with the bludgeon tool by itself of interest rates. It does not work. It does not produce the results we want. Everyone in the Eccles building where the, where the Fed is housed and everywhere else around the world um, seems to be unwilling or at least unable to look at Japan as an example of what not to do. Now, You can take a uh, look at that and say, well, why would anybody why would anybody do that? I mean, you have an example right here of experimentation with zero rates for a long, long time. This chart down here, I don't think you can see it, actually. Let me, let me open it up for you. This is the, come on, Google. Okay, this chart you're looking at now is Japan. Uh, GDP in the white, a moving average on GDP, the yearly moving average on GDP, and the Japanese overnight call rate. Now, as you can see, overnight call rate, with very few minor exceptions, has been at 
zero since 1998. And it's been below one since 1995. It's been below one for more than two decades. Does anyone in this chart, does anyone see in this chart any evidence that this is a positive for the Japanese economy? And I think the answer is obviously no, um, it isn't. So the example of Japan has always been there for anyone who cares to look. So the question might be, why do central bankers not look? Well, they certainly do look and they certainly know. The answer is quite simple. The only gig that central bankers have is interest rates. There isn't really any other tool. The reason central bankers lower interest rates is because that's all they can do. There isn't that much to do. We, Im we imbue central bankers and have ever since Greenspan with this enormous power to control the economy and it's simply not true. Now, it's not true that they don't have an effect. Of course they do. But the economy does not turn even remotely alone on interest rates. Yes, at the margins, I mean, if you raise interest rates at 20%, you'll squelch economic activity. That's true. But it doesn't follow that all of the other areas in the interest rate, in the yield curve, will have the same effect. Japan, as I've said this time, many times, whenever this topic comes up, is the chief example of this. The issues in the Japanese economy have nothing to do, almost nothing, to do with interest rates. Nothing. What have interest rates let Japan do? Live in a fantasy world of borrowing endlessly to stimulate the economy, which never gets stimulated. Japan has had one, two, where's GDP? No, this is not GDP. Yeah, this is GDP. Um, kind of hard to see which is a uh, the GDP rate here. Anyway, Japan has had one, two, three, almost four recessions since the, the Great Crash back in uh, 2008. So whatever's going on in Japan has certainly not been fixed by interest rates. The issue for central bankers is quite simple, what to do. So they are, and because they get more and more Take Japan, for example, the problems in Japan are not problems. Actually, many of the problems in Japan are not problems that can actually be fixed by the Japanese government either. Um, and that has to do with demographics, of course. Um, the Japanese could do some things if they wanted to make a more dynamic economy. They could let in more, many more immigrants. The biggest problem in Japan is they're, running out of, they're going to start running out of people and running out of workers. There's not a lot, uh, <coughs> comparatively, a lot of innovation as opposed to when years, I remember I mentioned the first time uh, years ago, God, I was still in college, when I heard a Walkman, the sound was astonishing. It's kind of the, almost the last time the Japanese had a, uh, a product um, in the consumer field that set the world alight. I mean, I remember that very well. You know, I think I was in a Volkswagen going down to Washington with a friend of mine, and he gave me his, he wanted me to try and listen to the, the Walkman he had just bought. It was astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. Anyway, so Japan's Japan's economic problems are not related to interest rates. Okay, that's I think we can all accept that as a fact. And then interest rates are clearly not the cure. That's there as well. It doesn't matter if they're 0.5 above or 0.5 below. And all of this can tie right into I've got to go do a uh, something on, on TV later on in the day, and it was uh, the last thing I, I wrote last week was that the Fed is running an equity test, and I think they are. Because, again, related to this interest rate policy, the Fed is making this enormous fuss, letting everyone know, and this is completely deliberate, that they're going to, they're very seriously considering raising rates in June. They're pretending 
that this is, if, if the economic, the economy continues the way it is, this is, if the economy continues to improve. This is nonsense. That's not what they're paying, what's not what they're doing. They are planning, if they can, to raise rates. The reason they want to raise rates is because there is, first, a, a, if the markets don't overreact to this and immediately try and rush out to 3%, then it's going to have zero economic effect whatsoever. Zero. Um, and if they keep doing this very gradually, it won't have much economic effect, um, at least in the United States. It will, however, position the Fed to be in a better, a better place, which is, I think, what they're very concerned about, when, it, if, when the next recession comes. And there is going to be another recession. The Fed has an outlaw of recessions. And they know this. In addition, I think they are well aware that the one of the reasons for low productivity and low growth is because there isn't any good judge for what's an economically beneficial investment. If you're starting a new business or opening a new plant, what's your largest cost? Well, it's probably the money you're going to borrow to open the plant. If you don't have any good guideline for judging what the money costs you because Fed is keeping rates artificially low, then how do you judge whether or not a plant is going to be economically viable over the next 10 or 15 years? The Chinese have this problem in spades with all of that development they're doing that has no economic purpose except to keep people in work and off the streets. Okay, but back to that. So the Fed is looking at a 25%, 0.25% interest rate increase, which will make no difference whatsoever, essentially in the economic life of the country, unless, of course, it sponsors a equity sell-off, which is what happened back in January. The Fed raised fit rates on December 15th, and two weeks later, on the 30th, the market takes a very long and unpleasant dive. I think what the Fed is trying to do this time is to see if that's the case. Markets tend to respond to new stimuli far more vigorously than they do stuff that they've seen before. So for the Fed, the first raise rates, everybody completely, to put it in the colloquial term, freaked. Markets went bananas. Everybody started selling. The world is over. The world didn't end. Um, and I think they're running a test this time to see if that will happen. And the evidence so far um, is that it hasn't. Now, we must remember two things. One is that the uh, equity is the last time took two weeks to have an effect. And two, the Chinese started devaluing the yuan, and that actually correlates pretty closely to the movements in the S&P, which is what I tracked. Um, no one's paying a lot of attention right now, so I get a lot of press to the value of the yuan, but the value of the yuan has gone up 12% um, since uh, the past three weeks. It has, excuse, has gone down 12% in the past three weeks. From uh, April 29th until today, the yuan is devalued 12% against the U.S. dollar. Um, that is a noticeable amount. Okay, so let's leave that alone for a second. I'm, I'm going to talk about that this afternoon anyway. Um, so zero rates produce a different world. The linear relationship, just as in the quantum world, Two things, something can be, and I have found this fascinating, although to be honest, I don't, I don't really understand. I do not understand the math behind it. I have to get my niece who goes to MIT to explain it to me. Um, because logic and sensible logic don't apply. Um, it only applies and makes sense when described in the mathematical world of physics. And unless you understand that mathematical world, which speaks a very much di different language, in the world of our senses, it seems to say the least magical that something can be in the same place, two places at the same time. That's certainly not a corporeal trait. So the difference between 
the normal world of Newtonian physics, of interest, linear interest rate relationships. Those, that's the equation. Interest rates go up, economic activity and inflation goes down. And the zero bound world, where the effect that you're looking for when you lower rates, we heard, used to hear a lot after, right after the, the, the uh, financial crisis, that the problem, this is Paul Krugman's great idea, uh, demand gap. There isn't enough demand. People are there, too many factories, too many shoes, too many windshield scrapers, and not enough purchasing of all those things. And since people, the factories continue to make them, the prices go down as they try to clear their inventory. Well, the inventory is still very, very high, inventory to sales ratio. So what do we do about this? The idea of zero interest rates or very low interest rates is to spur demand, essentially. Um, people will not keep their money in bank accounts because they're not earning any interest or perhaps they're being charged to keep it there, so they will go out and spend it. Companies because they're not earning any money on deposits, we'll go out and lend more. But what have we found that actually happens? So we're expecting in this world, the normal relationship between interest rates and the economy. It's an inverse relationship. That's what we're expecting. Lower rates, people spend more. Lower rates, Banks lend more because they don't want to keep it on deposit where they're being charged. Now, what do we find, especially on the consumer side, which after all, an economy like the United States means 70% or more of economic activity. Paper clips, we all buy more paper clips. What do they find? That it's almost the opposite effect. When you lower rates to zero and people don't get any money on their accounts, as I don't, what do they do? What's their reaction? It's not to spend more, it's to save more. And the logic of this is irrefutable and very apparent and also very sensible. Why? Why do people save? People save generally for old age, for retirement. That's one of the main drivers of savings. When you stop working, you don't wanna be broke, if you can help it. You don't wanna be put into, as they used to say in the old days, the poorhouse. So when you can, if you have $100,000 on deposit, but you're not earning any interest, you know that, and this has gone on for now, how long, almost 10 years? So all the interest that in a normal world you would have earned over that time is missing. It's not in your account because you didn't earn it. Because the Fed is forcing rates down, financial repression, whatever terms you want to use. So what do you do? You still need the same amount of money when you retire. So how do you make up that difference that you didn't get? You save more. It's a perfectly normal and logical approach to the issue. It's apparently one that none of the economists working for the Fed could figure out. And I, this I don't understand. They truly expected their equations to provide the answer. Lower rates, people spend more, but that's not what happened. Lower rates, people save more. So the exact effect in fact, since they're probably worried about it, I mean, there's, there's a psychological effect to this too, that is, well, you know, after eight years after the financial crash and everything else, why are rates still at zero? What does the Fed know? What is the Fed worried about? Okay. So we find that the economic effect, and this is what I mean by the quantum world of zero rates, it reverses the linear effect that might be expected, and it's not exact, of course, we're talking about economics, is 180 degrees incorrect. Instead of spending, people save. 
Look at the business side of it. Banks have excess reserves. They keep them at the Fed. Just They're not doing it right now. They're just getting very low returns. But in Europe, they're being charged to keep their returns there. They're losing money when they keep money on deposit. So what, what, what would be the logical assumption under this, uh, you know, the linear lay? Well, don't keep them there. Let's lend it out. Two problems. One, you have to lend it to somebody. The banks can't go on the corner and start handing out loans to passerby. Someone needs to come to them. They can mark it. But someone needs to come to them with some sort of use for this money. Well, if consumers are saving more and not spending more because they're not getting any interest and they still need the same amount of money when they retire, then wherefore is the incentive for businesses to start building plants to produce what and for whom? Businesses don't build plants because they need to get out there and do something. The economic reason for building plants is to produce goods that can be sold for profit. Identify a market, that's the ostensible reason. Well, if you have little confidence in the growth that you're seeing, if consumers are not spending more, and they're certainly not earning more, then wherefore are you going to get the logic to go to a bank and say, give me a loan so I can go out and build new, a new pallet manufacturing plant. If you don't see the sales, then you're not going to do that. And so the expectation of central bankers that low rates would spur consumption, not true. That it would spur loan growth, not true. That it would sp spur loan demand, also not true. So the world, normally, I mean, I just bought a car. And one of the reasons I chose this particular car um, was because it had zero rates. But I only went out to buy the car because I needed the car. Because our old car had been, had been wrecked in, a, in an accident. So I didn't go out and get the car because... I could get zero interest rates. I chose the particular type of car, the manufacturer, because of zero interest, but it did not generate my demand for a new car. So interest rates, low zero interest rates, have been uni a uniform failure, in my mind, at spurring demand. Exactly the opposite of the linear relationship. Well, you know, on the interest rate side, you expect, well, People say, hey, mortgage rates are really low. Let's go out and buy a house. Let's buy three homes. Let's you know, flip homes. That hasn't really happened. It is not interest rates in this world, the zero rate world, that move economic decisions. I mean, look at the Japanese experience. All that has happened in this vast amount of time, two decades, the Japanese have been running this experiment, is central bank, I mean, central government debt has skyrocketed. I think it's now over 300% of GDP. China should take this as an enormous warning. Not that the Chinese have to go into debt at this point to start um, goosing their economy. They have all that trade surpluses they built up over these years, uh, finances and that. But uneconomic investment does not do anything more than goose the economy in the very short term. So again, we're at the quantum world which, as I've said before, is a world which could have been observed in Japan, but nobody bothered to, nobody cared to. And to my mind, the reason that no central banker took and did, you would think that the Fed would 
and maybe they did that I don't know about it, it's quite possible, that the Fed would, you know, direct. If they're considering dropping rates, but you know, they dropped rates to zero in the heart of a crisis where you could say it's understandable. I mean, the uniform response of the Federal Reserve in the past 16 years, 17 years, has been to lower rates. The Fed funds rate, which is here, let me just put this up, hang on one sec. Okay. Has been, except when the Fed raised it here, the low interest rates. This, this is Alan Greenspan's response to first uh, the the tech crash on Wall Street, and then 9/11, right? And then this Bernanke's response, and then we're back here again. So since about essentially 2000, rates have been <clears throat> around one percent or lower, except for this period right here. So you have a clear indication that economic growth at this bound is not responsive to the same degree to interest rate changes as it is in other higher areas of the Fed yield curve, uh, what the Fed charges, what the interest rates are. And again, this goes back to the problem of what the Fed is able to do, what the Fed actually has tools to do. The Fed cannot change tax law. The Fed cannot budget for the federal government. The Fed can't do a hundred things that could have a more powerful effect on the economy than interest rates. Nevertheless, the Fed is treated and has been since Greenspan as if it were the custodian of the economy. It is not. It can have an effect, absolutely. It has a role to play without a doubt. But the Fed clearly doesn't run the economy. Okay, so if the zero rate policy is uneconomic, meaning it doesn't really work, what's the Fed to do? And this is what I think is becoming a fascinating topic, so I'm going to talk about on the tube today. Um, what is the Fed to do? If you look at the, uh, you know, the Fed, Fed supposedly has a, a price and a, a jobs mandate from Congress. And if you look at the non-farm payrolls and the run-up to the December 16th rate increase, in the six months before the December 16th rate increase, there were the average 230,000. Um, in the year before the Fed rate increase at December 16th, they averaged 230,000. Since their increase, they've dropped, uh, it's only been, you know, just, uh, you only have three months. Um, it's dropped to 208,000. So just based on that, you could say, whoa, why is the Fed considering raising rates? You had a, a serious fall off in employment in April, 160,000. Um, the Fed is, of course, anticipating, and some of there has been some support for this um, in some of the statistics that the economy is going to pick up in the second quarter. It always seemed to me highly suspect that the economy switches on and off quarter by quarter. That's not really true. Um, so there hasn't been really any variation in non-farm payrolls in the year leading up to the December 16th. And there essentially has been very little since then. So if the economy resumes and you get back to the 230,000 average um, in May, the Fed's only going to have one more non-farm payroll before the June meeting, which I think is the 15th. 
So say it goes up and it brings the average back to 230,000. That's certainly not an improving economy, simply what it was before. Inflation, same thing. Inflation, if you look at PCE, it's averaging about 1.3, I think, um, in the period. Uh, it's about the same now, it hasn't really changed. So there isn't a lot of variation in the statistics over the past year that is really prompting or not the Fed to raise rates. There certainly isn't any acceleration in jobs. There certainly isn't any real acceleration in wages. You've seen a blip um, recently, but then it dropped back down. So what is the Fed up to? And I think what the Fed is trying to do is to get off the zero bound because they are wary of the future. And I think they have realized, these are smart people, their outlook may be bureaucratic, their tools are limited, they never disavow the faith and hope given them, and they should. They should, in my mind, should get the Fed out there saying, diminishing their own role and what they can achieve. That would be the sensible thing to do. But of course, that's not happened. They pretty much bask in the power um, and hope granted to them by the media and also by many business people and, and people in general. But it's not really the case. The Fed can't do all the things that they are being asked to do. And it would behoove them to have a little modesty to get out there and say, you know, we can't do this. This is, this is not going to work. Getting off the zero bound because it's not doing any good. And when the recession hits, we need to be higher. And I think that is true. You can look at China as opaque as some of the uh, statistics and uh, what's going on in the country is as an example. The US just, just put on tariffs on steel, why? Because China has built an enormous steel capacity for which there is no demand. So what are they trying to do? Well, there you go. You sell the price at lower, lower, lower prices, you put everybody out of business, then you'll suddenly have demand that can be satisfied by your <coughs> by your plants. Okay. Hold on a second here. Let me just bring this, let me just bring this back up. Okay. Okay, let's just finish this and then we'll, uh, we'll go. So for China, um, the direct result of having built up all of these plants is that they can, no, they can no longer sell their goods. So the result of zero rate interest policies is an enormous amount of malinvestment that distorts prices and distorts economies around the world. Um, as I said earlier, the Yuan has devalued against the dollar about 12% um, in the past three weeks. If I have to check those figures, but I'm pretty sure they're right. Um, that's a rather astonishing amount. It would seem to be a warning to the U.S. So far, the equity markets have not really taken this to heart. So back to what the Fed is doing. The Fed is running a test in my mind to see whether markets, commodities, equities, credit markets can handle rising rates. If the equities don't panic, and so far they haven't, it hasn't been very long, so far they haven't, or in the next couple of weeks, then it seems that the Fed is saying the Fed cannot go out and have five 
members of the uh, the governing board, both voting and non-member, over the past week, say interest rate rates are completely likely, and if the economy continues as to improve, they just mean continue as it is because the economy is not improving. Um, and matter of fact, for the past two quarters, it's been unimproving. It's been going down. We went to 1.4 and then we went to 0.5. So how that qualifies as improving is beyond me. It's not. And the interest rate hike, if it happens, would be in mid-June, long before the Fed has any real handle on what the second quarter is going to be like. They're not going to have many statistics. It's going to be six weeks into the second quarter. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's going to be two months into the second quarter, eight weeks into the second quarter, um, before it has any for the statistics that are out. There are very few forward-looking statistics. So they're not going to have a lot of information about the second quarter that they're saying is going to recover. So back to the idea of zero rates in the quantum world. I think they have realized that, and it was an experiment. Remember, this experiment in a number of the central banks around the world, duly ignoring the Japanese, of course, as if they hadn't done anything for the past 20 years, um, to see if zero interest rates will work was an experiment. Nobody had ever tried it, except for the Japanese, of course. You have to ignore that. Nobody ever tried it before. So it seems that they are realizing that it's a failure. It doesn't do long term what they expected it to. It does not spur economic growth. And its negatives pile up and amass, and they need to get off this zero bound, as it is said. So that's why when you're looking at it, the Fed interest rates, I mean, the Fed statistics over the past, this economic excuse the United States, over the past six months have not changed very much. They're not really improving, they're not unimproving, they're just sort of coasting along at very low GDP, past six months, and very low and moderate job creation, most of which, um, a good portion of which is part-time and low wage. And inflation has picked up a little bit. That's it. This is hardly the type of economy in a traditional interest rate world that warrants an interest rate. It's not the economy that the Fed is raising rates for. It's not the economy because it's beginning to out, beginning to heat up, because job and creation is starting to get out of control, because although because interest, because inflation is starting to get out of control. That's not it. So we are at the point, I think, where the Fed has realized that the zero world is a quantum world. It's not the relationship of other parts of the yield curve. And that, I think, is something. My, my guess is that the Fed and other central banks are not going to try and run this experiment again. Um, because it really didn't work. And so we're going to have to go and stay with what is going on in the other parts of the world. Okay, um, I'd like to ask Adinda, um, do we have another five minutes here or is this done? You know what, I'm going to end it here. Um, okay, folks, I thank you all very much for coming. I'm sorry there's a little bit of a slow start here today. Uh, turned out the uh, wireless keyboard I had here was out of batteries and it took us a while to figure that out and so that was part of the delay. Um, I hope everyone here found the uh, today's talk interesting. We'll be doing another one next week. Um, I'm not sure what the topic is yet. If anyone has any interest or any considerations for what they would like for a topic, please let me know um, or let Adinda or Mauricio know at FX Solutions and we will certainly bring it up. Again, thank you all very much for attending and uh, we will see you next week. Take care.